Here's a map of Antarctica seen from above the South Pole. And in the bottom right, you'll see South America peeking in. And at the top sort of center is where New Zealand is. And you'll see some squiggly lines cutting around the ocean there. That first one, the southerly one, is known as the Antarctic Convergence or the Polar Front. And this is an oceanographic boundary, a place where the relatively colder water south of that line bumps into, but doesn't really mingle with, the warmer water to the north. And this is a biological barrier for many organisms. It changes uh, whether the life that you find in the ocean changes whether you're on the north side or the south side of this polar front. And north, there's another oceanographic boundary. This is called the subtropical convergence. And again, colder water to the south, meeting but not readily mixing with the warmer water to the north. I'd also like to take a moment to point out a feature that will play a, a lot to do with our itinerary and what we're going to do in the coming days because from this perspective you can see the only place in the world where an ocean current can go all the way around the globe 360 degrees of longitude is there between the gap between Austra uh, Antarctica and South America. And because there is no land getting in the way here, we have a circumpolar current, which has a lot of impact on what can live here, how food is distributed, but it also affects things like wave height and the weather that we'll encounter. Now, Going back to sea surface temperature, that's what we're looking at in this diagram here. And as you would imagine, the warmer colors like reds and yellows, oranges, those are warmer sea temperatures. And the cooler blues and violets are the colder temperatures. And especially down near the bottom of South America, you can see they're very clearly delineated. There are zones and the colder water is further away from the equator. And cold water can be very productive biologically. It seems kind of uh, against logic that the tropical waters, where they're nice and warm, are not as productive as the temperate and polar waters. But it's because of a simple physical property, which is the ability of a cold water to hold more dissolved gas in it. And I'm using these beverages here in the photo to show you because you all know this principle whether you put it all together or not. A warm beer or a warm Coca-Cola, when you open it, it has a much bigger head on it. It froths up a lot because that liquid, the water that's part of that beverage, can't hold all of that dissolved gas in solution. A colder beer can and a colder ocean can. And the more dissolved gas you've got in solution, then the more oxygen, say, you've got to breathe if you're a fish or a krill. We're looking down from space here. That's the coast of Argentina on the very left-hand margin. And right in the center are the Malvinas Islands or Falkland Islands. And around those islands, you'll see the ocean is not blue. It's a weird mix of turquoise and greens and things. That color variation is caused by a bloom of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is the basis of the marine food chain. It's what everything else eventually eats. Think of it as the grass of a terrestrial food chain. And the marine algae that make up this basis of the food chain are growing in such profusion in this particular area that you can see the population bloom from space. So very productive waters because of cold nutrient upwellings and this forms a very rich place if you're a seabird. That phytoplankton gets fed upon by krill. If you haven't seen krill, here's one here. It's a shrimp-like crustacean found in enormous numbers in um, both polar oceans, but particularly here in the far south. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them as we go, but krill is very important in the diet of most seabirds and of course with whales and some seals. And I will stress too that this is a shrimp-like crustacean. It's not a shrimp. It's about the size of your little finger when they're fully mature. 
uh, but don't make the mistake I did and talk to a crustacean taxonomist and call them shrimp. They do not like that at all. <laughs> Something to do with number of mouth parts and things. It's, it's a long, sad story. The names aren't so important here, but the different colors here are showing you the distribution of the world's albatross species different color for a different species. But the main thing to take away from this map is how there's a, there's a little bit of color in the North Pacific, but there's nothing in the tropics. The albatrosses, these great gliding birds that can go tremendous distances, they're making their living in the cooler waters, predominantly in the Southern Hemisphere. I've seen at least one albatross today. Those of you who have been looking out will have probably seen black-browed albatrosses. They're out there now, and we'll be seeing them in the coming days in greater numbers. Now, all of the seabirds, and I'm lumping them a little bit together for the moment, they share a couple of things in common. One is that they're generally very long-lived. Some of these birds have been banded as, as adults, and we know that they've made it to 61 years of age. Uh, there's a current record of a North Pacific bird that has made it to 72. But routinely we're finding albatrosses at known age well over 40. So we're talking a very long-lived animal here. And this is uh, a feature of, of these birds. If they're living a very long time, then once they meet, reach maturity, they, they're going to be there for a while. And most of the seabirds also share a long-term pair bond. And that's what biologists call, um, the, that's the formal term for they mate for life. Mate for life is not very accurate. Um, it, it's, and it's usually um, shorthand, but basically these birds will stick with the same mate. If they're successful at breeding this year, they'll probably remain mates next year, and so on and so on. Occasionally there are, are splits, but if they're, co if they're compatible, especially with timing, then they tend to keep the same partner, sometimes for decades. And I mentioned yesterday when I talked about the penguins that these birds are taking in a lot of extra salt that they have to excrete somehow. And they do that with a salt gland that's located just above the eye. And you find this across all the seabirds. It's a gland that can take the extra salt and it actually excretes it so it runs down a duct out the nostrils and drips off the end of the beak. And you can see on this Antipodes albatross there's a little drop of water right on the end of the beak. That's a hypersaline solution that is this bird's way of getting rid of all the extra salt that it's taken in. Now I'm going to start going through some of these birds now and we'll start with the tube noses, the Procellaria forms, that is the albatrosses, the shearwaters, the petrels. These birds are the most amazing flyers in the world because they're ranging out thousands of miles from shore. If we think like terrestrial mammals and think that you've got to be close to land to be safe, these birds change your opinion of all that because these birds are going all the way across the open oceans. Some of them will spend literally years between putting their feet on solid ground. They're called tube noses because their nostrils are nice little tubes located on the top of the beak. And they come in a wide range of sizes from the giant albatrosses that have wingspans over three meters or 11 feet across uh, down to birds the size of a swallow. This is the Wilson storm petrel. They're all in the same petrel family, petrel order. And let's look at an albatross wing for a moment. This is a great wing for gliding. It's not a good wing for close navigation through a dense forest canopy. But that's okay because they live in an open ocean. Lots of wind, no obstacles, and this long, thin wing shape allows them to harness those winds and move for hundreds of miles with barely any energy expended. 
It's so effective, of course, that human aeronautical engineers have copied this design with gliding aircraft, non-powered gliders, are long, skinny winged for the same reason. Here's one in a museum for scale. They need a big open place to get up into the air. And of course the ocean provides that. They point themselves into the wind. They, if it's windy enough, they just have to open their wings and, and up they go. But normally they've got to run across the surface of the water and build up just enough speed to, to take off. And then they can lock their wrist joints and elbows in such a position that they don't have to flap much at all. They can do what's called dynamic soaring, playing with the way the wind reflects off of the waves. And when they come in to land, they also need a tremendous amount of space. And this is why I see this is very different, again, than like the sparrow or blackbird you might see at home, which has the ability to fly um, very intricate patterns. It can stop quickly. It can take off vertically. It can move through the brush bushes uh, without hitting itself on a tree branch or something. All of that's because their wings are of a different shape. But out in the open ocean, those would be a real hindrance. Here, the albatrosses reign supreme. It's probably one of the reasons why so many of these albatrosses and petrels, though, nest on cliffy islands in the subantarctic. Those are the islands that are not quite as far south as Antarctica. Their latitude's not quite that high. It's sub-Antarctic. And the beauty of nesting on an island like this, if you're one of these albatrosses, is you can just jump off a cliff with your wings out, and as you go plummeting towards the ocean, you build up enough speed to generate your own lift, and away you go. If you were on a flat sandbar, you know, you'd have to run along like a, like a long uh, aircraft carrier. It takes a while. There are two birds considered the great albatrosses, the wandering albatross and the royal albatross. There's a southern and a northern royal. And these birds are contesting the crown of the longest wingspan of any bird in the world. There have been some royal albatrosses measured at over 11 feet from tip to tip. That's about 3.3 meters across. So enormous wingspan. If you're, uh, if you're paying attention to the rest of the world, birds, the second place goes to the Andean condor, which we may have a chance to see if we get lucky in the Chilean fjords. Bald eagles, down way down the list, around six or seven feet across. And they use these wings to travel tremendous distances. And the data I'm showing you here from a study where satellite tracking devices were put on the back of free-ranging albatrosses, and each row of numbers represents a different individual. And I want to draw your attention to number 99-1, because that bird on the far right, you can see on one trip, it flew a, a total of 6,589 kilometers. It's about 4,000 miles on one foraging trip. Imagine if you had that kind of range to go out to look for groceries. They can do this without burning a lot of energy because of those long winds, long wings. Now, while 99.1 went a long way, look at the bird above it, 97.4. This is the slacker of the group here. It only goes 875 kilometers, but if you go two rows to the left, you'll see it did that in 2.1 days, a very short trip, and it still went, went almost as far as our ship would travel in the same time. Not quite, but almost, but they're doing it, of course, on just a few handfuls of squid and fish. Tremendous range. Now, if we take that 99-1 who's done the really long flight and give you a sense of perspective. If that bird was nesting in Washington, D.C., it would be like it flew out to Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, and then down to Austin, Texas, and then back to Washington, D.C. That is about the same distance that that bird has flown. Of course, it's zigzagging back and forth across the Southern Ocean, but a tremendous, tremendous range. 
and they could do it again with these incredibly long, thin wings. That's a wandering albatross on the left, and on the right is a black-browed albatross, which we've just seen outside today, and we're gonna see for the, in the coming days. Don't worry, if you haven't seen one, you will get the opportunity. They often do follow the ship, so you'll, get, you'll be able to see them. But the bird that are on the right is the size of a bald eagle. So it's still got a six or seven foot wingspan. It's a big bird, and yet it is quite dwarfed by the wandering albatross. The name for this bird comes from the, the dark feathering. Looks like it's wearing a little bit of eyeshadow. And like all of the tube-nosed birds, all of the albatrosses and petrels, um, the black-browed albatross lays a single egg. Just one chick each year. And they're going out foraging, getting krill, getting squid, getting fish, bringing it back, and then vomiting it up for the chicks. Although unlike the penguins, when the, the albatrosses do it, the chick has to take the vomit from inside rather than having it directly delivered. You gotta work for your vomit if you're an albatross chick. But they do grow up to be what I think it must have been the inspiration for Big Bird on Sesame Street. There's a, an albatross chick that's starting to molt off the down. He's about four months old at this point. Now, we may get a chance to see the light-mantled albatross, which is found in these waters as well. This is uh, another species of the same, and it's the only one of the albatrosses that nests in Antarctica proper. All the other albatrosses are nesting on the islands in the subantarctic zone and on the islands around Cape Horn, for example, but not in Antarctica itself. But there are a handful of light-mantled albatross nests that have been found in the South Shetland Islands. The southern giant petrel. Uh, we saw some of those yesterday in Puerto Madryn. You'll see them again in the coming days. They're quite ubiquitous, even close to shore. There's a northern giant petrel, which uh, is not found in the northern hemisphere. It's just found less far south than the southern giant petrel. And for those who are really serious bird nerds, um, there's two northerns here. The middle bird and the right bird are northern giants, and the left bird is the southern. And the difference is the color at the tip of the beak. If it's reddish, it's a northern. If it's greenish, or grayish, it's a southern. And these birds are sometimes referred to as the vultures of the Southern Ocean because they're, they're carrion feeders. They can actively prey upon living things, but they're very happy to take the scraps of animals that have died and are lying around. In this case, it's a fur seal pup that's not yet dead, and it's just kind of staking it out to see if there's a meal there. And uh, when there is, the birds are in fighting amongst themselves for the good bits, just like vultures would do on a downed gazelle. For some reason, they really like red licorice. Now, amongst this group, there's also smaller birds that are the size of a little dove, like the prion. And the prions are often found in groups flying very close to the water. They're infuriating for bird watchers because they all look so similar. There are five different species in this photo, and I've used museum skins to, to be able to put them together. But it's very challenging to tell the difference between a broad-billed prion and a slender-billed prion, for example, just on the wing. The Cape Petrel, sometimes called the Cape Pigeon, or the Pintado Petrel. This is a bird that we will have following the ship for sure once we leave Ushuaia. It looks like it's had paint splattered on the top of the wings. There is a chick in the bottom left of this photo as the adult approaches it to feed. This is a bird that nests in Antarctica as well as the islands around Cape Horn. Further south is the Antarctic petrel, and this is found only nesting on the Antarctic mainland. So we'll have to be very lucky to see some of these flying by us when we get further south into Antarctic waters. But they follow the same pattern that many of these birds do of zooming along close to the waterline underneath the waves. Sorry, not under the waves, in the shelter of the waves. And a chick 
poking its head out here from underneath the parent. They need to do this to shelter, of course, from the cold weather as they're being raised. The southern fulmar, another type of petrel. You can see the tube noses here. And like the Antarctic petrel, they nest on rocky cliffs. There's no real nest. They lay their egg right on the ground. And you can see it's not a, a particularly comfortable looking bit of rock, but it seems to do the job. The tricky part for all of these birds, though, is when to start. And I mentioned yesterday about the challenge of nesting where you've got uh, snow on the ground. And this bird, in fact, had started. It's got an, an egg underneath it. It was all set on bare ground. And then we had a late season snowfall. And it was covered. It just kept its head above the snow. Amazingly, though, we kept track of it, and about two weeks later, as the snow melted away, the bird was still sitting there on the egg, and it did, in fact, uh, successfully hatch that chick, because it stayed sitting tight. If it had gotten up, of course, the egg would have frozen. There's a bird called the snow petrel, also, to be found in the far south, another Antarctic exclusive bird, and it breeds further south than any other bird or mammal with the possible exception of some shenanigans at the South Pole Research Station. Now, snow petrels are seabirds, remember, so it's pretty odd that some snow petrels are nesting inland. They're actually going as far south as you see that blue dot there. That is a very long commute to the grocery store. If you're trying to get food from the ocean and you're nesting on a mountaintop that far inland, you've got hundreds of kilometers to go just to get to the sea. And yet they are doing that in small numbers, and it's thought that they do that to nest in a place without the dangers of predators. You can see where the name comes from, very snowy, blends right in. And here we've got the nests of two birds back in a crevice. This is how they like to nest, because by going that far back, it gets difficult for the larger predatory skua, a predatory type of gull, to reach them. So they are very much uh, concerned with being eaten while they're on the nest. Small crevices like this make all the difference. That swallow-like bird is the Wilson storm petrel. It flits about. We may see them as we're going a little further south. They're actually found throughout much of the world. You can find them in the North Atlantic, off the coast of the United States, and off Western Europe. They're so light that they can seemingly walk on water. They've got their wings out, a little bit of flapping, and their feet are disturbing the surface of the water as they're looking for small crustaceans, so thing, things called copepods and such. It gave the impression that they were walking on water. And they got the name Petrel from the biblical story of St. Peter walking on water. The Magellanic Diving Petrel, a very small bird. And you can see how small, because here it is in my hand. Um, it does just what the name says. It dives underwater, swims with its wings, like a, a small penguin in a way but it is capable of flying through the air as well. And this one of the smallest of the tube noses sometimes comes aboard our ship. They're attracted to lights, particularly in places near their breeding colonies where the young birds are confused by the lights. And it's, this bird sometimes ends up landing on the deck here. If you find one of these birds, they're usually cowering in a corner trying to hide. That's because they're unharmed, but they can't take off again. There's too much stuff in the way. They need this long runway. And when they find they can't get up in the air and, and leave, they find a dark place to hide. So if you find a bird hiding on your balcony or in a corner in a public space, please let one of the crew know. The ship has special bird crew that are trained with how to gently handle these animals. Don't try to pick it up yourself, please. Now, moving away from these birds, we're getting into the next group, into the cormorants. And this is the Antarctic shag, sometimes called the Antarctic cormorant, or the imperial cormorant, or the blue-eyed cormorant. There's so many different names for the same beast. And now that you've seen it, when you get to Antarctica, 
if you see a cormorant, you'll know it's this one because this is the only species of cormorant found in the Antarctic. You're now all experts on Antarctic shags. These birds um, are found on other islands as well in southern South America. We we'll, we saw some yesterday at Puerto Madryn, um, and we'll see more in the ports to come. They are a very different kind of flyer from the petrels and the albatrosses because they have a heavy body, which they are diving for their food with. They're going underwater, swimming with their feet to catch fish. So they've got a pretty heavy body and long wings are not gonna really help that. Look at the shape of the, uh, the wing here on this cormorant. It's quite broad and it's relatively short. And as a result, cormorants don't glide very well. If they're not flapping, they're losing altitude. They, they have to flap to actually keep moving at the same level or to rise. If you compare their wing, if you look at it underneath here, you can just see it's very wide. It's kind of short. In fact, cormorants don't go that far from land. Early mariners knew that when they saw, started to see cormorants, that they were getting close to shore somewhere. Compare the cormorant on the left with the albatross on the right. Very different lifestyles. Here's a colony of cormorants. They actually build nests out of seaweed. They pluck off the floor of the ocean, bring that up and make a bit of a nest with their guano. And they'll have two or three eggs. Those are two chicks sitting there. They're almost the same size as the parent. The school, a predatory type, is closely related to the gulls. I mentioned them yesterday with the penguins because they do attack small penguins. They're also very happy to scavenge on dead food. Uh, and they're happy to take fish as well. The kelp gull, sometimes called the southern black-backed gull, or the Dominican gull, and this is a bird that we've already seen in Puerto Madryn. This species was there. It's in Ushuaia. In fact, it's in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. It's also the only gull that's found in the Antarctic. There's also the Antarctic tern, the only species of tern that nests in the Antarctic. Now, they nest on little rocky hills like this, and they don't build a nest either. They're laying their egg right on the rock or in a little depression on the rock. And you'll notice the birds are all sitting up on top there where the wind is strongest and the snow is most shallow. Just like with the penguins, they will not nest on snow. They need bare ground. So these places that are a little bit higher than the surrounding zones will lose the snow earlier and allow for a head start on a very short summer breeding season. The difference between where the snow is in this photo and where the birds are is about the difference between the height of your bed and the floor in your stateroom. And yet, that difference can mean three weeks, maybe four weeks head start. The snowy sheath bill, also in that last group, kind of the terns and gulls. And I draw your attention to the feet on this bird. There's no webbing on these feet. This is, in fact, probably, you could argue it's a land bird. It does not stay in the Antarctic during the winter, but it visits in the summer, and it makes a living around penguin colonies, where it's a good scavenger. A rather tenacious predator, although it's pretty small, so it can't take big penguin chicks, but it'll take eggs if it can. And they have one of the most gangly looking chicks I've ever seen. But this is a bird found in southern South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. So another bird that, that may be on our visual radar. Now all of these birds are living in a challenging environment with the, the quest for food, the quest to stay warm, and many of them are living out of the way from where people are, and that, that certainly helps a lot of their conditions. But they do have some threats. The changing climate is certainly one. As sea temperatures increase, that changes the distribution of food. 
and sometimes the availability of it altogether. So a changing climate has impacts where some species find it hard to forage. Commercial fishing is also a challenge in two different ways. Direct competition, where human fishers are going for the same thing that the seabirds are after. And most likely these days, in the Southern Ocean, it's happening in the form of krill harvest. Now this uh, cartoon krill is part of a display for the product that's coming from these fishing boats. The, and there's been an increase in the last decade in the number of ships fishing for krill. The amount of effort that's going in for a commercial fishery for them is really increasing. Krill are found in big swarms, so when you get a few krill, you, you're usually getting tons and tons of krill. And that is being harvested for this product, krill oil, as a dietary supplement for humans. It's very rich in omega-3 oils, much richer in that than most fish species. And so there's a, a booming demand for it in the health industry. That's not to say this is the main use of krill, though. They're still largely used as food for aquaculture. So like salmon farms and things like that will be fed pellets made from dried krill paste. So an increase in our consumption of krill is something that uh, scientists are keeping a close eye on because uh, everything else in the Antarctic, all the whales, the seals, seabirds, penguins, are relying on this food source too. The other way that commercial fishing has an impact is through direct mortality. Birds getting caught on hooks and pulled under the water and drowned. And this happens largely because the birds are attracted to fishing boats because there's fish scraps, there's the bait on the hook. And in particular, it seems to be a problem with what's called long lining, which is just what it sounds like. It's a very long fishing line that could have, say, 10,000 hooks on it. And it's got weights on it so that the fishing line sinks down low near the sea floor where the fish they're trying to catch live. And each fish has a bait on it. But this is very attractive as these things go over the side of the ship on their way down. From an albatross perspective or a petrel's perspective, that looks like a squid and I'm diving for it and I'm gonna get it before it gets away. And fortunately, if they do get it, they also get the hook and they get pulled under. Here's a line of hooks uh, ready to be deployed. And so it's led to a lot of interest and a lot of engineering thought about how to minimize that. And one of the, the things that's starting to make a difference, because the, the fishers don't want to catch birds. That's not their intention. That's less fish that you can get if you've got an albatross stuck on your hook. And this thing called a hook pod is showing great promise. And that is the hook here is inside the plastic vial. So you've got the squid hanging on the hook. That's your bait. And if you're an albatross and you grab this, there's no hook to get caught on you. The hook is protected inside, where of course a fish can't get it either. But as this hook descends, the pressure opens the vial and opens the hook. And this happens at a depth so great that albatrosses never see this. It's too far down for them. Lastly, there are threats to these birds, not the ones nesting in the Antarctic, but those nesting in islands around South America and in the sub-Antarctic zone with introduced predators. Things like rats, which have never been part of their, their uh, environment on some of these remote islands. But the release of things like rats means that a ground nesting petrel is very much at the mercy of this predator. And on Gough Island in the South Atlantic, in the sub-Antarctic zone, they found that they don't have any rats there, but they have house mice. And the mice there have learned to eat birds. They are actively coming up to, net, to the nestlings, the chicks of albatrosses and other petrels, and they're just basically eating them alive. This is a very endangered species of albatross, the Tristan albatross. There's only a few hundred pairs of them left in the world. And the behavior of these chicks, as with most albatrosses, is they just sit on their nest waiting for mom and dad to come back with food. And you know, you get something annoying like a mouse, you're gonna snap at it, but you know, if you get a few mice, you're not gonna be getting all of them. 
So this is a real concern, and there's a project underway to try to eradicate the mice from this island. Recently, there's also been a, a threat to some bird colonies in the form of a disease called avian influenza, which is a naturally occurring disease that, unfortunately, two years ago started uh, with a new novel strain that has affected birds, particularly in Northern Europe, and now moving through the rest of the world as birds migrate around and spread the virus. So it's been found in South America all the way from Colombia down to Tierra del Fuego, it's now made it out to the island of South Georgia, one of the sub-Antarctic islands. It's thought it might get to the Antarctic this year. It has not as yet. But it's something that uh, the national Antarctic programs of every nation have been paying a lot of attention to and are trying to monitor. It is not a threat to people, but it is affecting birds and some seals. But I want to finish on a different note about how the birds are in fact helping protect themselves and it involves fishing ships and those fishing ships that wish to hide their location to do undisclosed fishing possibly illegal fishing or unmonitored fishing and as you know the, the ocean's a big place it's very easy to hide out beyond the horizon but all ships today have what's called an AIS beacon on it, an automatic information system that is a, a basically a little tracker that sends a signal to the satellite that says, you know, this is where I am, and it's identifiable to the name of the ship. This is an image I took from, yes, last night from a website called Marine Traffic. It's open to the public. If you want to see where ships are in the world, uh, take a look at it. I mean, for example, here's where the world ships were yesterday, last night. Um, different colors for different types of ships. The green are cargo ships. The red are tankers. The blue, those are passenger vessels like ourselves. And the reddish orange ones are fishing vessels. Let's, let's just jump back. Well, before we leave this image, note how little uh, little shipping there is down near Antarctica. Anyway, around South America, this is what was traveling just about 12 hours ago. And you can see there are different kinds. There's the cargo, there's the tankers, there are the fishing ships, fishing boats. But the point is you can see where they are because of this system. And so you can see whether a fishing boat is inside Argentina's exclusive economic zone, for example. Unless they were to turn that beacon off, and some ships apparently do that. And this is where the albatross comes in, because some French scientists working on sub-Antarctic islands in the Indian Ocean have put devices on albatrosses that not only log the albatross's position, but are able to register whether they're picking up radar from ships. They're like radar detectors. We'll come back to that in a moment. This mess of color you see here, all of those green squiggles and the orange squiggles, and if you can really see closely, there's some light blue squiggles. Those are the tracks of albatrosses flying around the Indian Ocean, zigzagging around on their quest for food, just doing whatever it is that they do to get food. There's some yellow dots to be seen in here, and that is where these birds, fitted with these devices, were detecting the use of radar. Now, a ship that is trying to fish illegally might turn its AIS off, but they're not going to turn their radar off because they need that for safety purposes that little thing on the top of the ship that's always circling and circling, sending out a radar signal, the, the properly fitted albatrosses can pick that up and determine that, oh, there's a, there's a ship there. Oh, but it's not showing on AIS. So it's all very fascinating that these birds can now be sentinels moving around Southern Ocean. And if we look at their findings, the green dots that you see here are ships that were sending out a radar signal and had their AIS on. But the red dots, those were ships that were there, 
but had turned off their AIS. Now we don't know why, it could be that something was broken, or it could be something a little more nefarious. But there's, you know, a considerable number of red dots in this, in this photo. It's not just one or two. Interestingly, they found that about a third of all the ships had their AIS turned off. Now that is a lot of ships. A lot of ships that have either a problem with their AIS or have deliberately turned it off. So the technology that's now being fitted to some of these birds is allowing us to get a better handle on the fishing effort that's happening. And the fishing effort, of course, can have impacts on the population of the birds themselves. So it's an interesting way of kind of turning the tables and the albatrosses are now policing the remote ocean. I'll just close by pointing out that as we travel through the water, we have our propeller churning up the sea to push us along. And some birds find that very attractive. And so there will be some birds that will follow the ship. And if you take a chance every time you, you're around the ship, at least once a day, go to the stern and, and take a few minutes to look out the back because there will likely be a giant petrel or an albatross or maybe a pintado or Cape petrel following us. And they'll keep coming, crossing back and forth over our wake. We don't throw anything overboard. It's not that they're getting a meal of garbage thrown out or food scraps pumped out or anything like that. What they're doing is following what looks like a natural upwelling, a current that's bringing things from the depth up to the surface. And in fact, our propellers can do that. So it's worth their while to follow this current especially because it's not costing them a lot energetically to follow us. Lock those wings out, swoop along with the wind, maybe you'll get lucky and see some food. It seems to be worthwhile. So please, even if you don't need to know what they're called, you're not a bird watcher, I do recommend you spend some time looking out, especially off the stern, and enjoying some of these amazing seabirds. Thank you for this attention today. Because of uh, scheduling, I won't be going to Gatsby's for questions, but I will be going out, and if anyone has questions, I'll be on the port side near the deck six entrance in about five minutes. Happy to chat with you there. Thanks again for your attention. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Glad to have you join me again. <clears throat> we hope to get through this without the interruption we had at the last lecture. We have a different computer working, so we hope all goes well. Uh, the